everybody, thank you so much for joining us for today's Brown Bag Lunch, which is supported through the generosity of Dennis Anderson of Atlanta, Georgia. We're really excited um, to be here today to talk a little bit about NFS Grundvig. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Edward Broadbridge, who has joined us um, to talk about his particular area of specialty. So thank you so much. Good morning and good afternoon. It's lunchtime. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch uh, and listen in if you care to. Uh, my name is Edward Broadbridge. I was born in London in 1944. I studied theology and English at London University. And then I met my wife, Hannah. Uh, she's Danish, so I emigrated to Denmark and taught at university and high school in Denmark until 2008 when I retired as a teacher or as my wife learned in America don't call yourself a teacher you're an educator <laughs> so I'm here as an educator <laughs> to educate you about the thoughts of NFS Grundtvig when I retired in 2008 out of the blue came a request to start work on translating NFS Grundtvig who is the most important Dane who ever lived. More important than Hans Christian, more important than Søren Kierkegaard, even more important than Victor Ball. <laughs> <laughs> However, you perhaps don't know that. The Danes do. If you ask a Dane who is the most important Dane who ever lived, it's Nikolai Frederick Severin Grundtvig. And he's best known around the world as the father of adult education. Um, the six volumes are here, and I would just briefly point to them to give you an idea of the breadth of Grundtvig's thought. The first one on the left is the school for life, which is Grundtvig's motto. The school must be for life, lifelong learning with interaction between teacher and student. The school for life, then come living wellsprings these are the hymns and the songs and the poems of Grundtvig many of which are in the Danish hymn book or and or the Danish uh, high school uh, song book he wrote 1500 hymns and songs and a couple of hundred of them are still circulating and 50 of them are fantastic <laughs> absolutely brilliant poetry and my task was to make them singable in English to the Danish tunes. You probably know one that goes, Lovely is the midnight sky. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. Huh? This is audience reaction. Thank you. Thank you. The third book was Grundtvig's theological thoughts and his sermons. He loved the pulpit. And he loved the lectern. He was a great speaker. The fourth book is his political thoughts. He got involved in politics as Denmark became more and more democratic with the actual constitution arriving in 1849. And the fifth book is Grundtvig's philosophical thoughts and his relationship to Kierkegaard. Um, they were rivals, and yet the younger Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, we call him in, in Danish, respected the older Grundtvig, and the older Grundtvig admired the young rebel in Soren Kierkegaard. And when I finished those five books three years ago, I thought, I'm not finished with this project. I have so much going around in my head, I need to write a biography. And I couldn't do this alone. I needed a Danish friend to help me. And he needed me to help him because the biography has come out in both English and Danish. It's the same text, it's the same thoughts, but it's just in two different languages. And so the last book I have called Denmark's Catalyst because it's Grundtvig in the middle of the 19th century who changes things radically in Denmark, and I hope in the next three quarters of an hour, 
I can prove that to you. There might be time at the end for a few questions and answers, hopefully answers too. Um, when Grundby is born in 1783, you can see that Denmark was a big kingdom. This is long after the Viking Empire, which also, don't forget, included half of England and also um, Dublin and Ireland, because Dublin was founded by the Vikings. Um, Norway and Denmark were a single kingdom and south of Denmark were two duchies called Schleswig-Holstein, which were German-speaking. So at the be beginning of his life, you had three languages, Norwegian, Danish, and German, spoken in Denmark. And you have a multicultural Denmark. By the end of his life, this is what is left. Norway has seceded from the Union and become an independent country in 1814. Bismarck and the Germans have taken over Schleswig and Holstein. In 1864, they invaded those two duchies and made them German. And suddenly, Denmark is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And Grundby is worried, along with many other Danes, what is going to happen to Denmark? Will it become a, just a German territory? And so he set about reviving the Danish fortunes. He turned back, among other things, to the Nordic myths. He turned to his own Christianity. He turned to the history of Denmark, the music of Denmark, the geography of Denmark, and of course, he said, the language of Denmark. At university, everybody had to pass their exams in Latin, in Latin, a dead, dead, dead language. And Grundby, as you saw, is the promoter of the living word. He said even about the Bible, it's dead letters until you read it aloud, and then it comes alive. So he places the oral tradition before the written tradition. He was born in the little village of Udbu, where his father was the pastor, and here he lived until he was nine. Here he learned from his mother how to read and write, and from a living in a live-in maid who was an elderly woman, a cripple, she had a wonderful singing voice and a wonderful narrating voice. So Grundtvig heard the hymns and the songs of Denmark, and he heard the Nordic myths she would tell him stories about Odin and Thor and Balder and all the other great Nordic gods. When he was nine, he needed better education than was available at home. So he was sent to Jutland in the west of Denmark and to Turugod, where he was confirmed aged 14 by Pastor Lauritzfeld, who was also his teacher. He learned Latin and Greek and a little German and a lot of classical history and Nordic history. And it was Pastor Feld who took him on to his first school at the age of 16 when he went to Aarhus Cathedral School. Aarhus at the time was a small town of 4,000 people, but it did have a magnificent cathedral which I invite you to visit next time you're in Denmark, the longest cathedral in Scandinavia. They can't boast about much in Scandinavia, but this one is the longest. <laughs> and we're not the happiest people in, in the world, we're the second happiest. <laughs> Finland beats us every time. Um, he called school here the black school, or the school for death, because here, he just had to do rote learning. The Latin verb for I love. Amo, amas, amat. Amamas, amatis, amat. Amo, amas, amat. Amamas, amatis, amat. It means I love, you love, he, she, or it loves, we love, you love, they love. Amo, amas, amat. <laughs> and he was so tired of this because it didn't relate to anything in real life. So he didn't do much work at school. He was there for for two years in high school. 
and yet he passed with flying colors. You know the sort of boy who doesn't do any work. And then three months before exam time, he just says, oh, it might be useful to know a few things. And then he goes up and sits in front of the, the examiner and passes with flying colors because he's been listening in the background and suddenly it all becomes real for him. He wrote a wonderful poem in which he apologizes to his teacher, Jens Staugor, on, on your right, uh, for wasting his time. Staugor, bless his heart, actually cried tears of sadness when Gruntry left school. That's how much their relation had matured. The only teacher Gruntry worked for was Staugor. And there was a mutual respect between them. Staugor knew this boy was going places. Which places he wasn't sure. But <laughs> since Gruntry's father was a pastor, his grandfather was a pastor, his great-grandfather was a pastor, and his great-great-grandfather was a pastor, it was most likely that Gruntvi, who was the last of seven children, two, three of whom were already pastors, himself would be a pastor. And his education was a training for this. He went on to Copenhagen University, where for three years he studied theology. And he's only 20 years old when he graduates as a theologian. He, all he needs to do to become a pastor is to pass, uh, to take holy orders, to pass the bishop's exam. But he doesn't want to be a pastor. He wants to be a writer. And he wants to try to integrate the old Nordic myths with the new Christianity. Christianity came to Denmark in the year 1000, roughly. And many theologians of the time said, forget the Nordic myths. They have no meaning in the world of Christianity. Not so Gruntvi. Gruntvi said, no, we can learn from those Nordic myths. Look at the great god Odin riding his eight-legged horse, Sleipner. A god cannot ride four-legged horses, can he? He needs eight legs to get around. And note, please, that Odin, the greatest god of them all, has only one eye. Where has the other eye gone? Well, he went to the well of Mimia, a wise woman, and he said, make me wise. And Mimia said, of course, just take out one eye and drop it into the well. So he did. And he lost his eye and gained wisdom. It's a fair exchange. <laughs> On your right, you see one of the first effigies of Christ on the cross. Not a limp Catholic Christ, but a challenging Nordic Christ who's saying, come on, come on, come on, take me on. Come on, you want to fight? I'm ready. And that was also Grunt's attitude to life. He was an irritating, cantankerous, but genius of a man. But he didn't like to lose an argument. In fact, he never lost an argument in his own mind. In 1805 to seven, he's the private tutor to the nine-year-old son of Lady Constance Leth, with whom he falls in love. But she's married. And there's nothing he can do about it, except write and write and write. And the good rationalist Gruntvi now becomes a romantic, almost just like that. Round her shoulders, gold hair fell. Blue as heaven were her eyes. Every step she started on rose and set, my joyous son. Like the song of birds, her voice, always loving was its tone, but the heart beyond the tongue, never was it mine to own. <laughs> we know that he was desperately in love with her. It was his first, it wasn't an affair, but it was, it was love at first sight. And she did not actually discourage him 
She had one hand that said, oh, Grunfi, how nice to have you here. You're such an intelligent young man, and you're a good teacher, and you're good company for my little boy. But I'm married. So Grunfi was in such a dilemma. He wrote a diary in which he wrote his thoughts, so we know that he was in love with her. And he know what a shock it was for him to meet her and admire this woman close up because he lived in the house. He dined at the same table as them. They conversed about the latest novels in, and books in Danish literature. And she was a very intelligent woman, very beautiful woman, and charming and attractive in any way, every way. He wasn't, Grunty wasn't the only one who was attracted to her. And he was worried that when he, when he said, I'm leaving, I can't take this anymore. She said, no, don't leave us. We've got another tutor lined up, but his name is such and such. And Grumpy said, oh no, not him. No, no, I'm staying. <laughs> and so he did. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he becomes a teacher for two years in high school but then he's called home from Copenhagen to his childhood village, Ulbu, south of Copenhagen, to help his aging father. And Grundby says, he writes a letter to his father saying, I'm sorry, Daddy, you may be getting old, but I've got a career to make in Copenhagen. I'm my own man now. And then his mother writes a letter, <laughs> Grundby, who do you think you are? You owe this to your father, come home right now. And Grunby gives way. In the process, he has a nervous breakdown. A friend accompanies him back to Udbu from Copenhagen. And as they overnight at Vinbuholt Kork, the, the inn where they spend the night, in the middle of the night, the friend wakes up to see Grunby climbing up the wall, pretend, oh, not pretending, but, but when, when the friend asks him, what's the matter, what's the matter? He says, the devil is possessing me. There's a snake around me, all the way around me. I'm, 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 it's the devil, get him off, get him off, get him off. His friend calms him down, brings him home to Udbu, and tells his father what has happened to the son. He's had this breakdown. The father says, hmm, that is scruples. <laughs> scruples, you know the word, I'm sure. He's not sure what he should be doing, but he knows he belongs at home, helping his mum and dad. His father wants him to be curate, and so he decides he will be a Christian. He asks himself, am I a Christian? Am I truly a Christian? And he decides, yes, I am, and yes, I will be. However, you can see in this famous painting on your left, that he sits with his dilemma in his father's church at the communion rail. What should I do? Am I doing the right thing? He writes his first hymn at this point. This is a breakthrough, which sometimes happens when you have a breakdown. It's also a breakthrough. And he writes, lovely is the midnight sky, his first of 1500 hymns and songs. He, is, he spends two years helping his father, and then he goes back to Copenhagen when his father dies because he cannot get the job that he wanted in his father's church. And in 1811, he gets engaged to be married to a pastor's wife, uh, sorry, a pastor's daughter called Lisa Blicker. They get engaged in 1811, and they get married in 1818. That's seven years of engagement. That's, that's a long time for a gal to wait. <laughs> However, it's because he has no cash. You cannot marry without cool cash in those days. In other words, he should be able to look after his wife. And he couldn't do that without a steady job. Eventually, he does get a job as a pastor. And he, they have three children, uh, Johan, Sven, and daughter Meta. And Lisa devotes herself to Grundtvi. She even calls him Grundtvi. That is a sign of respect from a wife to a husband, and especially a husband who's becoming more and more 
well, should we say better and better known? He's not always known for the best. <laughs> he's often known for the worst. He's, he, he likes to challenge people. There is a rebel in him. And Lisa serves him, really, as his devoted and faithful wife for 30 years. He gets this job in the Church of Our Saviour in Copenhagen, one of the most beautiful, and you can visit it next time you're in Copenhagen. <coughs> it's, um, he's, this is the pulpit from which he occasionally read aloud one of his new hymns to his congregation. And it's also the, pul the, uh, the church from which he was buried. It was full of the two and a half thousand people came to Grundby's funeral here. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1825, he had what he calls the matchless discovery. And this is that the church precedes the Bible in the living word. In other words, between Jesus' death in around the year 30, 35, until the first gospel, St. Mark's gospel, in 65, there are 30 years where the church is growing. We know this because St. Paul wrote all his letters to the Romans, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to the Philippians. So the church is growing by the living word, face to face, word to word, mouth to mouth, ear to ear. And Grundtvig realizes that Christianity is an oral religion. It comes alive when we speak the words of Christ, especially the, uh, at the two sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion. So, um, Grundtvig is now a thoroughbred, old-fashioned Lutheran Christian. And he doesn't like the theology that is being taught at the university where they are also training uh, young men to become pastors. In fact, he thinks it's far too rationalist. Remember, he himself was a, a rationalist, questioning the Bible, questioning whether the miracles are true or not. But now he's a full-blooded Christian. So when Professor Clausen says, we don't know for sure whether the Bible is the living word, the truth, Grundtvig, publicly reproaches him, says, you are not a Christian, you are a professor of theology which is not Christian, you must resign. And what did the professor do? He sued Grundtvig for libel. <laughs> oh dear, big surprise for Grundtvig. You get an idea of his temperament from this, that he couldn't believe he was being sued for libel. He couldn't believe that he would lose the case, but he did. And he had to pay a fine. And he was placed under censorship, which meant that everything he wrote had to be read and checked by the chief of police in Copenhagen before it could be published. Many things got past the censor, but some of them didn't. And Grundtvig, furious with the world, with Denmark, with the church, resigned from his church post at Church of Our Saviour. And the king once asked him, what are you, what are you doing now, Grundtvig? And Grundtvig said, well, actually, because he had good relations to the royal family, he said, I'd very much like to go to England to study Beowulf, the famous Anglo-Saxon poem, the manuscript of which was in the British Museum. So the king said, what a good idea. This is good for Danish, uh, Danes abroad. Go to England, show them how intelligent you are, bring back your information, and that's exactly what Grundtvig did. In fact, he was so good at his job that the English Anglo-Saxon literary people almost, almost asked him to produce a whole range of Anglo-Saxon translations into modern Danish or modern English. But in the end, they said, no, we, we don't want a rotten old day to do this. We've got, a, we've got elegant, beautiful Englishmen who can do this much better. So Grundtvig was sent home, but nevertheless, he'd learned a lot about England. He had learned that you can build a tunnel under the River Thames. 
So in the summers of 1829, 1830 and 1831, he goes to England to study the Anglo-Saxon manuscripts in London, Exeter and Cambridge. And he's inspired by seeing the first tunnel built under the Thames on your left. It's still there. You can walk under it. It's called the Rotherhithe Tunnel. And it's a walking tunnel. There are many other tunnels now. <coughs> Excuse me. Tube tunnels, you know, underground tunnels for the trains. But he saw it being built and he thought to himself, this is the old Viking spirit. <laughs> and he reasoned thus. England was once part of the Viking Empire. The Viking spirit has lived on in England, but it's died in Denmark. I must go back to Denmark and wake it from its slumber with all the energy that I have seen here in England at the beginning, of course, of the Industrial Revolution. So he takes great inspiration both from the industry that he sees in England, but also from the dining hall at Trinity College, Cambridge, where Grundtvig is invited to sit at the top table with the staff, and the students sit on tables like you're sitting now. I'm at the top table, a little raised, and you're the students. It's a bit like Hogwarts, if you know your <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> Grundtvig is amazed that staff can get so close to students at university that they talk to one another. In Denmark, the professor comes in, gives his lecture, goes out again, and sees you at the exam table. That's it. But in England, the tutors are talking to the students, setting them essays to write, and talking about the quality of their work. The tutorial system, and Grundtvig thinks we must have this in Denmark. Not only must we have English industry, we must also have the English school ideas of interaction between teacher and student. And this must be at all levels. So he comes back to Denmark, and here's our first portrait of him in 1831, wearing the ruff around his neck, which is all pastors still wear. It goes back 400 years and it takes a bit of getting used to. Believe me, when I first saw a pastor come into the church wearing this ruff, he was going to marry me. Um, I was just astonished. This is medieval stuff. You know, why the ruff? It's a, it's a highly, highly valued by Danish pastors. It's a badge of honor, which they wear with pride. The first people's high school was at Rolling in 1844 in South Jutland. And it was a high school to prepare students to take over Denmark when the king retired as king and the new constitution came into place to bring constitutional democracy to Denmark. Grundtvig got involved around 1838 in this movement and partly he was worried that when democracy came to Denmark, it could be the plebs who took over and not the intelligentsia. So we must educate the people, both those up here, but also the farmers. 90% of the Danes at this time were farmers. And so in the winter months, he put the farmers to school for three months. And in the summer months, their wives went to school they not only learned to read and write, they also brought their knowledge to the, the table. And so the, it was the task of the, the teacher to listen to the peasant farmers. They would come with, one of my favorite examples is you know the proverb, necessity is the mother of invention. Meaning when you need to do something, you find a way to do it. The Danish version translated into English is necessity teaches a naked woman to spin. <laughs> and you've seen all the spindles in this wonderful museum. Can you imagine all those naked eaves? Yeah. Another insight Grundtvig had was, yes, Adam came first, according to the Bible, and Eve came second. But ever after, we're born of a woman. 
and he said the fundamental human being is female that's revolutionary that truly is that's part of his theology and we'll we'll see a little more about that later he is now inspired to contribute to the Danish church by publishing and this is a, a modern edition of it his song work to the Danish church these are the 1500 hymns uh, this is a modern edition you can see how many books it fills and he could write a hymn a day and as I said 200 of them are absolutely the best I know English hymn writing and I they're up there with the best of English and American hymn writing in the quality of their poetry Grundtvig was completely unmusical how do we know that he told us he wrote it down I cannot keep a tune I cannot sing for my confirmation candidates but I have music in my head I have tunes so he wrote his hymns and songs to known tunes and as soon as they were published Danish composers said oh what a gold mine <coughs> here's a new tune for your lovely as the midnight sky here's a new tune for the forest leaves are falling fast <coughs> Excuse me, his great uh, autumn poem, you probably know the tune. The forest leaves are falling fast, and winter now is yeah. That That's a modern tune. It's written 30 years or so after Grundtvig wrote the words. And he also wrote, just a little point, but that lovely is the midnight sky. If you're to sing all the verses, and you probably only sing seven, and that's all I've translated here because that's all that's in the new Danish uh, hymn book he actually wrote 19 <laughs> verses and they would have sung them they would have sung them and at his church interestingly all the hymns were sung faster than at any other church so when he was at the church called Vartol he was known his hymns were known as the Vartol gallops <laughs> because they galloped along it wasn't it was da, 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 as it should be and as we sing it nowadays but in Grundtvig's time this was another little revolution his church was a social center a theological center and a musical center and people came from far and, uh, far and abroad to go to a Grundtvig service this is my favorite portrait of him, a drawing by P.C. Skolgård, and it adorns the front of every one of these uh, beautifully framed books here. Uh, what a great face this is. And this is before, his, his, his whiskers here, they're a little bit longer than Elvis's, <laughs> but they're, they're, it's only in, in his 50s that he grows this big white beard by which he is known. And a lot of people know him from a photograph which was taken just before he died um, six days before he died actually with these long white whiskers but I think he looks quite handsome here and um, he also gave lectures in 1838 and 1843 he gave his first uh, two lecture series on recent history and classical mythology and here at one of the lectures in 1843 he finished his lecture and the audience started singing one of his songs back to him by way of thanks and out of this comes the singing tradition that the Danes love you never start a meal like this without singing not just grace but maybe two or three verses of a hymn um, at this moment in time of course in in uh, Denmark we would be singing we plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land they would be doing this everywhere many meetings in Denmark start and end with a song and that tradition begins with Grundtvig notice in the audience some women <gasps> Grundtvig wanted women to be educated <gasps> he was pretty much alone on this and I'll give you the reason why in a minute 
But here you see women present uh, along with the men and he is now at the stage in the 40s where he accepts that although he's a royalist by nature and thinks that God speaks to the king, the king speaks to his council and they decide what's best for the people, he realizes that democracy is coming. He calls it people rule. He doesn't actually like the word demokratie, which is the Danish word. That's a foreign word. Wouldn't be wanted all things Danish. You know, we have a very old navy, as your t-shirts tell us out there. My favorite t-shirt here. It's got this lovely Viking ship, very old navy. I wear that one in Denmark with pride. I'm a naturalized Dane. Um, but what is, who are the Danish people? They have a history, a language, a, a music and song tradition. They have their own little territory. But in 1848, the year of popular revolutions throughout Europe, Grundtvig writes this poem, Of the People is Our Watchword. And here he says, and I'll read it for you, People? What defines a people? What does of the people mean? Does a nose or mouth distinguish how a people can be seen? There were peoples long before us, great or small, with that word blessed. Whether there is still a people, we must now put to the test. Then comes his own answer to the question. Of a people, all are members who regard themselves as such find their mother tongue sound sweetest and their fatherland love much and that's how he defined the Danish people so if the Danes could subscribe to this they were part of the Danish people it doesn't work of course for America because in America there are peoples plural and we will come on to that a little bit later but one of the great problems as I've seen from a lot of the planches here in the museum when do you stop being a Dane and become an, an American and one of the answers is when you stop speaking Danish when you can't speak Danish when you don't even want to speak Danish when your great grandfathers plea don't forget your Danish don't forget the roots don't forget your airplane schema <laughs> So, you, all of you here, I know, you retain a streak of Danishness because you relate to the Ebleskiva, to this museum, to, <coughs> excuse me, to the flag, perhaps not to the language, but um, Denmark became democratic. How did this go, go about? Well, in 1848, the people marched to the royal palace to demand democracy of the king. You know what happened to the king in France? He lost his head and his wife lost, and many others lost their head. But the Danish democratic rule came by agreement. When they presented their protest to the king, the king said, put simply, that's a good idea. <laughs> yes, okay, I'll be a constitutional monarch and you, the people, will take over. Grunvi, as I said, was not sure about whether the people were to be trusted yet. They weren't yet fully educated. So you can see him here in the picture. Have a good look at the picture and spot Grunvi. Second floor window. You see him up there? The second floor window, looking out, thinking, is this democracy? What is it going to lead to? He need not have worried, because when the first democracy, the parliament, met, okay, it was only for 20% of the Danish people. Male, 25 years old, homeowners, well, that's it, you know, forget the rest. Grundtvig did not vote for the constitution. He said it didn't go far enough. What about the rest of Denmark? What about women? They should have the vote. My goodness me, that is quite a revolutionary thought in Denmark in 1849.
Guruji is here, but you can't see him. He's right at the back, and I can't get out of here to show you, but he's, he's at what's called the vanishing point. And the vanishing point, the vanishing point is where the line here and the line there, perhaps I will crawl out of here and show you where Guruji is. You can't put up a picture without illustrating. And I don't have a pointer that can do it. Okay, it's not too good a picture, but Grunt is sitting here, behind, behind everybody else. These are the leaders of Denmark, the new democratic government, and Grunt is here, pushing, urging the people on. Lisa, his first wife, grows older and slower and gets what Grunby calls a heavy mind and she dies in 1851. Um, Grunby is a widow for the first time. He finds very quickly a second wife, a very intelligent, wealthy widow, Maria. And he marries her and as an engagement present he sends her this poem what is it my Maria which tells us that we too in speaking or in silence at rest or much to do feel we are closely wedded like church in prayer embedded like worshippers and priests it is because we wish for each other as we are because we too can carry each other as we are because awake or dozing, our mouths will soon be closing together in a kiss. And this is one of the most beautiful um, songs. And it's sung all over Denmark. By Erde Mi Maria is the Danish title. And in my need to translate it so that it's singable to the Danish tune, as, as the hymns are singable, I make one or two compromises, all translators have to. But I do have friends who tell me the English is as good as the Danish. Grundtvig himself said you cannot translate Danish into any other language without losing half of the meaning. <laughs> so I was challenged when I set out to do this. And it's never been done before. And I only humbly suggest that the reason I can do it is that I have 50 years of experience of speaking English and Danish every day and that deep down in me is a poet and I write po I've written poetry since I was 14 so I have a feeling for words and an understanding of Danish culture but my dear wife Hannah who unfortunately passed away last year has been a tremendous rock many a dinner have we enjoyed well, at least I've enjoyed it talking about Gruntry. I think she enjoyed it too, actually, because I asked the questions and she had the answers. Gruntry marries Maria and is wonderfully happy. This is really the truest love of his life. And Maria conceives a child and bears the new baby, a boy called Frederick Lange. Frederick actually, later in life, comes as pastor to the church in Clinton, Iowa, and is here for 19 years, trying to keep the Danes Danish. But the way things are going, the Danes are becoming American. And unfortunately for him, he is, he's on a, a loser. Uh, eventually he goes back to Denmark with his wife and child, and, and dies a rather disappointed man that the little Danish colony is losing its identity to the big American corporation world. Um, unfortunately for Gruntry and Maria, after childbirth she dies very suddenly. She catches, a, she get, gets a cyst on her breast and dies as a result. And Gruntry is heartbroken. Um, we've had that poem, I'm sorry. Um, while she is still alive, on the right hand side, let's go on to this one. Um, he meets a woman called Matilda Phoebe. She is the first feminist novelist in Denmark. And her book, 
Clara Raphael comes out in 1850 and it's condemned by all the male critics. She's an upstart woman. Who does she think she is? Women can't write. We've had that stuff in America too and England and all around the world. It's actually a good book. I've enjoyed it. I've translated it and I'm still looking for a publisher for it. And Grundtvig supports her. He even invites her to come to his home and write her second novel. So she stays with him and Maria for three months and does, they, they were the happiest time of her life, she says. The little baby, Frederick, in this picture on, uh, is three years old. Grundtvig himself is 74 and it's 1857. Little Frederick is wearing girls' clothes this was a custom in the Victorian period, and we think, we're not sure, we think it has to do with toilet training. Because when a little boy wants to go to the toilet, he can't do the buttons, undo the buttons quickly enough, quickly enough, quickly enough. So he just wears a pair of knickers like girls, and he can get to the toilet when he needs to. They turn into boys' clothes when they're about four or five. Maria, his second wife, actually, found Grundtvig. It wasn't that Grundtvig was on the lookout. She found him to ask him a question about theology and he gave an answer that she was not satisfied with. So she challenged him and he sent her packing. First time they met, they had a quarrel. And <clears throat> who does she think she is, you know? But then she came again and Grundtvig was intrigued because she was an intelligent woman. She was intellectually his equal, and she was a powerful woman. She owned her own estate after her first husband's death. She took over the estate. She even sold some of the plots to the estate farmers, the peasant farmers, so they could own their own estates. This is the beginning of the, the whole movement later in the century, when farmers began to own their own plot and could decide that over their own crops, instead of sending them to the lord of the estate or the manor and, and getting a little pittance in return. A third wife comes along and she too is looking out for Grundtvig. It's not the other way. She's 32, Grundtvig is 76. She too is a wealthy widow. I can't say Grundtvig went for wealthy widows, but it didn't hurt. They, they were young, beautiful and rich. <laughs> Never hurts, does it? And Aster also gave birth to a child. Grundtvig, age 76, becomes a father for the fifth time with three wives and he names his child after his three wives. Aster, Maria, Elizabeth, Grundtvig. And there she is. And she was his devoted nurse. She looked after him through his old age. She even held parties for him where all his fans, and there were many by now, uh, came to their big home outside Copenhagen. There might be a thousand guests. They would put up a te tent in the big garden and they would have candlelight dinners and Grundby would appear and give a speech and be praised and clapped. And he was now becoming a national monument for all the things that he had given to the Danish people. Here we have the only picture of him in his church where he spent the last 33 years of his life. This is in Copenhagen and you can visit it to this day. It's called Vartol. He was given the honorary title of bishop and he's known around the world by many, also in the States, as Bishop Gruntry. But this was an honorary title. He didn't have a diocese to look after. One of his great supporters was the Dowager Queen Carolina Amelia, who in 1840 wrote the following about Grundtvig. Grundtvig is a true preacher of love. None more than he wishes to make the world free and loving. It is the message of love that he preaches, the true gospel. Grundtvig's theology very basically is that God created us all. We are nevertheless fallen but we have within us a streak of the divine, all of us, and we must recognize it and cherish it and build on it and grow in the faith, not least by singing. 
Danes, I venture to say, sing their faith. If you stick a microphone in front of a Dane and say, are you a believer? Oh, I'm, I, 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 I'm not sure. I went to church last Christmas. Um, I know, does that make me a Christian? And the more intelligent would say, mm, yeah, I'm a cultural Christian. I'm a cultural Christian. Because Denmark is a culturally Christian country. And so uh, here Grundby is giving the benediction in front of a packed congregation. Now, I have five minutes more and then there'll be time for questions and answers. And this was my task in 2008 to translate selected texts of Grundtvig. Uh, he wrote something like four million words, published words. I translated 580,000 of them. I counted. <laughs> there is an archive with another two million handwritten notes and pieces of paper, which we are now beginning to access through a big grant that we've got. We are also digitalizing everything that wouldn't be published and putting it online in Danish, of course. So if you want to read Grundtvig in the original, you can. But my hope is that these books here will go out to university libraries and people will begin to interest and get interested in Grundtvig. It, one group or another. Most of them will be interested in the educator. Um, this is what I was faced with. This is one sentence of Grundtvig's in the original Danish. <laughs> On historical learning contains 5,232 words, minus the title and footnote. 45 sentences, average length 116 words. Now you know the average length of your sentences when you write to a friend is 20 to 25 words. When you text them, it's four, <laughs> including abbreviations. So if you look at the bottom, this sentence contains 32 commas, six semicolons, 11 times the word and, four times the word but, four times the word when, and three times the word undeniable <laughs> one of his favorite words how dare you question me and one period at the end and i i use the salami tactic which is to chop it up into eight different sentences and write them in english and that's why some people say it's actually easier to read your english than old grundvis danish he came to be known as old grundvi all over denmark it was old grundvi have you read old grundvi's new novel um, I've, it's taken me 15 years to produce these books and at the end of it I thought I would do homage to the great man on his birthday September the 8th this year 2023 I went to his grave and stood by his coffin the grave is open twice a year and I was allowed in and there I have my hand on Grimpy's coffin and the other coffin you can see is his second wife, Maria, the, the love of his life, if you like. And uh, this was a great moment for me. There's not much left of old Grundby there, but old Grundby is now here in my heart and my head and my soul. And hopefully uh, he's in your lunch as well. Um, his church at Vartol commemorates him every year many commemorations but on midsummer day when the sun comes up they start singing when the sun goes down they stop singing and in between they're singing <coughs> excuse me hymns or songs from the hymn, the hymn book or the people's high school songbook he's also commemorated by a most beautiful church it's not so beautiful on the outside in my view but the inside is soaring pillars the Holy Spirit, as it were, going up to God. And I do recommend it if you ever visit Copenhagen. It's just outside Copenhagen in one of the suburbs. But this was called uh, Grundtvig's Church, opened in 1940. Um, Grundtvig is getting known, and he will become better known through these translations, which in turn are being, as you sit here, translated into Arabic, 
Bengali, Indian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and German at the moment. And the name Grundtvig arrived in America in around 1932. You'll see why in a moment. Uh, in 2016, President Obama made a speech to the Nordic partners in which he said, and he's speaking to the prime ministers of the Nordic countries in the White House. Many of our Nordic friends are familiar with the great Danish pastor and philosopher Grundtvig. And among other causes, he championed the idea of the folk school, education that was not just made available to the elite, but for the many, training that prepared a person for active citizenship that improves society. Over time, the folk school movement spread, including here to the United States. And one of those schools was in the state of Tennessee. It was called the Highlander Folk School, where a Tennessee man called Miles Horton went to Chicago and said, what is the origin of the, the Danish theology? And they sent him to Denmark and said, go and see the folk schools of Denmark. You'll get an idea of the Danish attitude to the people. His name was Miles Horton. He came back to Tennessee and opened Highlander Folk School, which had the following students among its students. You should recognize two of those faces, possibly three, possibly four, but not five. On the left, Martin Luther King. Standing behind him, Pete Seeger. We shall overcome was born at Highlander Folk School. It's an old gospel hymn. And he took it and made it, it became the civil rights anthem. Miles Horton's daughter in the middle, you won't know that. You should, or hopefully would, recognize Rosa Parks, who started the Montgomery bus boycott. And Ralph Abernathy, friend of Martin Luther King, a great preacher. And this stems from 1932. So in, uh, in 2032, you can celebrate 100 years of folk high schools in America. I call them people's high schools because I associate folk with folk dress and folk music and folklore. And, and Grundtvig's idea of the folk was the people, not just the folk. Although I know you use the word folk in, um, in, in America in a different way from the way we do. You, your president can address you as Reagan did and Clinton. Hello, folks out there. How are you doing, folks? A British Prime Minister would not do that. <laughs> Good afternoon. Distinguished guests, Your Majesty, and so on. Um, we have a Grundtvig Prize, uh, which in 2018 was won by a man from Korea who has his own radio station in which he's, he promotes Grundtvig's ideas. I'm humble and happy to say I re also received the prize for the translations of his hymns and songs. And Grundtvig is getting around the world. Here's Grundtvig for Filipinos. Uh, another Filipino who came to Denmark, learned about Grundtvig, took his ideas back to the Philippines, and has written a book about them. Here is Grundtvig in Japanese. My goodness, do you recognize the old man up the top there? Gamal Grundtvig, old Grundtvig. And the, um, the Danish, I think that's the parliament there. Yeah, yeah. From, uh, yeah. And Grundby in Danish, uh, Conte, Conte. I've, I've got Japanese friends who talk about Conte, Conte, <laughs> all Conte. <laughs> There's a school in Nigeria called the Grundby International Secondary School. Again, its leader went to Denmark to study the schools and the education system. And of course, the collective system that came with the cooperative movement that followed in the wake of Grundby. In the 1880s, all the farms decided to bring their milk to a central dairy, which then distributed it as butter, milk, yogurt, whatever, instead of them all making their own. And this cooperative movement moved on to the butchers, all the farmers bringing their meat. And the cooperative movement is what generates the wealth of Denmark towards the end of the 19th century. So by 1912, the Danes are exporting Danish 
bacon to my country, England. I grew up on it. And Lerpak butter and many other Danish products, dairy products. Although it wasn't till the 60s, 1960s, that industrial products overtook uh, farm products, dairy products, in the national uh, growth wealth. Uh, what's it called? The, the GDP, yeah, the gross national. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There have been Grundy conferences uh, for the last 50 years or so. This is the one in London uh, in 2018, uh, where um, people came from all over the world to uh, to talk about and listen to lectures on Grundtvig. My wife on the left is holding the poster there. She passed away last year, unfortunately, but um, she's been a great supporter of uh, the work I've done. And the last slide, but one, is to just give you three things to think about uh, and remember about Grundby. He is the catalyst, the one man, along with many others, who transformed Denmark radically in the 19th century. He ident identifies the people as being Danes, and he educates them to know that they are Danes. They have a Danish geography, Danish history, Danish language, Danish music, Danish stories, Danish everything. He was a great Dane, but he, didn't, he was not an anti-German or anti-English or anti-anything, except where their ideas encroached upon Denmark. And of course, German, Germany is the only border we have. And so German ideas, including Martin Luther's ideas himself, he was a great German, Grundtvig followed in his, in his tracks. But Grundtvig, if you ask the Danish church, the Danish Evangelical Church, it's the Danish Evangelical Lutheran Church, I would add it's the Danish Evangelical Lutheran Grundtvigian Church. <laughs> which is really what most people subscribe to these days. Secondly, he coined the phrase human comes first and Christian next. We are all born human before we become Christian. So we have this fellowship of humanity before we have a fellowship of Christianity. However, Grundby said, to be fully human means to be fully Christian. And he made the point that Abraham wasn't a Christian. Moses wasn't a Christian. King David wasn't a Christian. But they were all God's children. And they were all human before they were Christian. And he left it to God to decide what would happen to Odin and, and Moses in the afterlife. That's not for us to decide. Thirdly, and lastly, and the most important words he ever spoke because they are quoted in Denmark regularly to this day, at the end of a famous poem in 1819, he wrote the following. In this lies our strength, on this tenet we draw, that few are too rich and still fewer too poor. So you will know that the Danes pay an awful lot of cash in tax, and it comes back to them in free schooling, free university, with student grants to pay for their expenses. Free hospitals, free doctors, but not free dentists. And I've never understood why that isn't on the national health. But the dentists, they make good money. Um, you can get free process uh, in, in, in the law courts. And the other word I noticed, which I would like to uh, add something to, is out there it talks about the Danes' trust in one another. And it is true that Denmark, a country of six million and about the size of Ohio, is built on trust. We do trust, on the whole, our politicians. At the last election in November last year, a party from the right, a party from the left, and a party from the center went into government together. Imagine that happening in England or the United States <laughs> where we have problems even within the party on electing a speaker or on whatever it is you know it's, the, the Danes love the art of the compromise 
everybody gets a little bit of the cake. You never get everything. And they're not radical in their politics. All the Danes are social democrats in principle. Okay, we've got right-wing parties and left-wing parties, but they all subscribe to social democracy. And it's very well defined on one of the posters out here as being um, a social concept in a free capitalist democracy. So we're thinking about the other all the time and looking after the other and the young looking after the old, which is a problem nowadays because there are so many old people look at this gray hair and there are not enough young people to look after us. What are we going to do? Do we import foreigners? Oh, immigrants who don't speak Danish, it's gonna take them five years to talk to Mrs. Jensen, who's got a bad hip and wants to tell her that in Danish and she can't understand it. So we have a problem there and the latest move from the government is to say you can no longer expect the welfare care that you have been enjoying for the last 50 years or so. So there are going to be cuts and we don't know what's going to happen. Read this page. My last slide is the greatest honor that could befall any great Scandinavian. You get on to the tail fin of an aeroplane. <laughs> there he is, a Norwegian air tail fin. Oh God, I'd love to be up there with Grundtvig, <laughs> flying high in the sky. Interesting, they call him a Danish theologian. Don't forget, he was a poet, a theologian, an educator, a politician, a philosopher, all those things. And that's what these books are. Lastly, I will say, I'm here to show you Grundtvig's handwriting. I happen to have bought a, a letter that he sent at an auction once. I was determined to get it, so it cost me 3,000 Danish crowns, but I got it. And it's here for you just to see. Secondly, um, there are... There's a free badge for each one of you. Human comes first, Grundvi. Please take it as a souvenir of today. Um, there are, the books are available to buy, if you wish, for $50. There's a beautiful silk scarf here. This is the brown and red one. There's one also in gold and blue. This is Grundtvig's handwriting, two of his famous hymns, and his very last sermon. For the ladies or the gents, as you wish. <laughs> Mainly for the gents, here's the Grundtvig tie, with the same two hymns, and uh, the sermon written across in gold. That's his last handwriting that we know of. He was preaching until six days before his death. And then he was sitting in his armchair and his son was reading to him. And uh, the son went out for a moment. And when he came back, his head had gone to one side. A doctor was called and they tried to revive him, but there was no way they could. And he was um, taken, uh, he was laid on the bed uh, people came and paid their respects and then he was taken to this coffin, uh, the, into the coffin, into the church you saw. And then he was taken by steam railway down to his grave where another 500 people um, watched him, the coffin being laid to rest there. The last thing I have is I write a newsletter, uh, the Grundby newsletter, to which you may subscribe if you so wish. There's a a list here, you can just add your name and mail address. It comes out every quarter, it's two pages, it's free of charge, and you can just keep up with what's going on in the world of Grundtvig, if you are so inclined. But I quite understand if you think you've had enough today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, if there are any questions and answers, we have three minutes, <laughs> five minutes. Yes. You, uh, most politicians don't write their own speeches. 
Do you know who wrote Obama's speech? Was he Scandinavian or? or um, yes, you're quite right. <laughs> uh, Obama, I don't think, to be honest, I tell you how I think it happened. I, I don't know, yeah. but I think that the, the president invited all these heads of, of country, heads of state, to, to um, no, not the the prime ministers of the Nordic countries, to the White House, um, and he got hold of his speechwriter and said, "What shall I say?" Which is what presidents do. And speechwriters say, "I think you ought to mention Grundtvig. They all know about Grundtvig. <laughs> Who's Grundtvig?" said Obama. <laughs> ah, well, Grundtvig now, you know. Miles Horton, no, oh, Highland, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll put Grimby in. I think that's how it happened. But nevertheless, when he spoke those words, the Danes' hearts filled with pride. They pulled Danavor up to the top of the mast. Of course they would. And it was smart of Obama. He wasn't smart in that way. Um, because it's gone round the Nordic countries that Obama had heard of Grimby and knew how he'd heard of it. Miles Horton, Highlander Folk School. And the 70, there are up to 100 folk schools in the United States now. And about a third of them, I have this on very good authority, about a third of them call themselves Grundtvigian. I mean, Grundtvig based on Grundtvig's ideas. Anyone else? Yeah? So Grundtvig had a tremendous impact on America too. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've ever researched all the work he's done here. And I come from Chicago, where in Wisconsin, which is where his son first came to America, and was in Wisconsin. Um, and he did a tremendous amount of work in just na nature up there. So, That's right. But here in Elkhorn is where the first folk school in America was. Yes. yes. 150 years old. That's how old, uh, 145 this year. Um, they established the first folk school in this town here. Um, and that is spread across the country, that concept. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a, a wonderful story, the, the growth of folk high schools. And in, in America, I know they've, they've moved away from Grundtvig. There's a high school in Alaska where they have a course where you arrive on a Friday and you have 10 days to build a canoe. And how do you build a canoe? Well, you start by chopping down a tree. <laughs> well, how do you chop down a tree? No. You get a saw, you work together, and then you get out of one tree, a good high tree, you can get three canoes, you know, so then you have to, and that, that's not Grundtvigian. On the other hand, Grundby would love that because he had an understanding of the use of hands. He said, what you do with your hand goes into your heart, and, and therefore, when you're actually creating, making something, and this museum is a testimony to all the things that have been made, especially in wood, which I love as a, as a material. Um, it's a testimony to the soul and to the group who say the Holy Spirit is working through you when you're building that canoe. You may not be aware of it, but that's how God works. That's, that's what Grumpy would say. And he was in touch with God all the time, every day. He was a hundred percent Christian and one of the things I admire most about him is his faith because I'm still at the stage where I'm asking am I really a true a perfect Christian am I the Christian that Jesus would you know forget it forget it Grundtvig was as far as we know he was very all his theological writings all his hymns are hymns of praise to God and asking for forgiveness and so on. And psychologically, it's been proved in Denmark, certainly, that people who have a religious background live longer, because they have somewhere to turn to when things go, when things go wrong. Um, whether, we'll find out one day whether it's true or not, <laughs> or perhaps we won't. <laughs> there was another question. Yeah. Yeah, there's a famous uh, phrase in Danish, um, that is, um, on that era, the golden age, that uh, in a way united the Danish people. It says that uh, what you lose from outside, you came from inside. But who the tennis can in How is that related to Kurvi? Eh? Yes, it is. It was said in the in the year in which he died. So he wasn't. I don't think he was aware of it. But it was said by a poet, not a politician, who said, 
You remember in 1864, we've lost Norway, we've lost Germany, all that we've got left is little Denmark. Um, a, a poet wrote and said, what we have lost outwardly, we must gain inwardly. So now we are so small that we must relate to one another and we must work together. Grundvis, uh famous words. The common good. We must work for the common good, all of us, especially politicians. And therefore, th this word, this phrase, the common good, appears 54 times in this book. I counted them. It's one of the great things about Word and internet and so on. You just press a button and it counts for you. You don't have to go through every page and count them up. 54 times, the common good. The fittest beste, as we say in Danish. One more question and then we must stop. Yes. Will the books be available in public libraries? Oh, I wish you would ensure they were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've been to the library at uh, university libraries. I hope we'll get hold of them. Public libraries only go, will only get them if they are uh, somehow have a Scandinavian section, I would think. Um, if you go to your public library, I'm serious about this, and say, look, I've just heard a wonderful lecture <laughs> on this guy, Grunsvig. There's a new biography. It's very well received in Denmark. And it's going to be reviewed in Church and Life. <laughs> and really, your library ought to have this book, if not the whole series, but this biography. He is he's the most important Dane who ever lived. So if the library has anything on Kierkegaard and anything on Hans Christian Andersen, I bet they have. You go up to them and say, have you got nothing on Grundtvig? But he's the most important Dane who ever lived. I have it on very good authority. <laughs> and, and see what they say. Because it's the only way, the same goes for bookshops. Um, I've published books in Denmark on Grundtvig where the Danish bookshops don't have them because these people do not advertise. It's a university press and they don't advertise like the uh, private publishers do. They're, they're not in it for the money, so to speak. They're in it just to turn a non-profit organization. But I hope your libraries will get hold of this. I do have copies here. I will happily sell them to you today for 50 pounds cash. $50, beg your pardon. $50 cash. And, and some of the other books as well, if you want. Yes, last. What does this have a painful question? But am I the only one that has never heard of this guy? <laughs> 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 it's a painful answer too. I, I would say, yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. You, you, now you have. Um, and, and you're not alone. You're not alone. I, it doesn't surprise me, because he doesn't receive the publicity. Hans Christian Andersen was translated in the 1860s, and he's in a hundred different languages. Kierkegaard completely translated. Chinese, Japanese, French, everything, it's all there. But this guy is not known. And he deserves to be, because he's a great thinker in, in many different areas. Well, yes? You. I'm proud to say to you and to others that the Kilton Church, we grew up as one big <laughs> <Okay. laughs> oh, That deserves applause. That deserves applause. <laughs> Yeah. One last one. I grew up in Denmark and we sang the hymns every day in, in the morning before class started when I was in the basic grade school. Yeah. Every day. It could be the Gordon B or, or some of the other. Oh, wow. Every morning. That was yeah. Those were the days. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you could start your board meeting with a little song. Maybe. Uh, Maybe we can start a tradition here. <laughs> yes. I just want to bring in here. I was in Denmark uh, last summer and I listened to on the radio people talking about people aging. They said you come to a part of your life where you will either become more religious or more nostalgic. And I think being at a museum, we have made a choice <laughs> at that point. 
I don't, I don't know who spoke. I, I forgot who spoke, who spoke, but that was somebody from Ascot High School. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the great high schools. Yeah. There are nine of the original high schools still exist in Denmark. They were founded in 1844, the first one. Then 1850, 1860. Nine of the, there have been 200, but they go up and down. There are now 70 in Denmark. Some of them closed after six months because they couldn't make it financially. But that's, um, that's as it is. It's been a great honor to speak to you. Thank you so much for your attention.